flying around in orbit like this is not just a simple matter of driving on Earth, of course, uh, in a single plane. They're working in three planes here at all times, uh, and uh, it is highly complicated, and with the orbital speed involved as well. They're always moving at that, that orbital speed of around 5,700 miles an hour around the moon, and the maneuvers must be performed so that they calculate that speed and uh, still speed up and slow down individually to rejoin. This is the maneuver they're undergoing now. They're making this the 13th revolution, 12th revolution of the moon. They're on the near side. If we had binoculars powerful enough, we could see them crossing right in the middle of the moon, right at the equator, uh, as they make this revolution of the moon in these two spacecraft. The, uh, the actual redocking comes eight hours and eight minutes after the undocking. Uh, they begin the rendezvous procedure and uh, they, they really begin to separate. Uh, uh, they begin to separate and then they come back and they rendezvous and the total time that they're really apart, uh, far apart, is six hours in there. And so after a very tricky problem earlier today, uh, they uh, managed to get this undocking uh, to go ahead with the mission and now the trickiest part of the whole mission begins. This was the first flight in space uh, that really requires such detailed uh, pilot skill uh, that, uh, that the slightest uh, miscalculation could be disastrous because Tom Stafford and Eugene Cernan have to eyeball this, uh, uh, this flight as well as depending on their radars. The radar, of course, has never been asked to do the job. It's uh, going to be doing it this time in the uh, lunar environment. Uh, it, uh, uh, we do not know what the effect of those mass uh, cons, the concentration of mass uh, under the moon surface could do down at 50,000 feet. There are uh, moon ridges and uh, volcanoes, uh, extinct, of course, mountain sides that they're going to have to avoid as they come in for that uh, landing area. And that's the idea of this whole thing, uh, to get down there and find out how difficult it is to get down before man commits to actually make the landing on the moon in Apollo 11. As uh, Tom Stafford said yesterday after they got their first real look at the moon surface and then gave us that extraordinary look in the television transmission last night, it's going to be a real trick to go down among those uh, mountains tomorrow. Well, today is tomorrow, and uh, the real trick time has come. The timeline, let me give it to you once more as to what is going to happen here uh, this afternoon. Uh, it is now Eastern Daylight Time, 3.43 uh, p.m. Well, at 4.35 p.m., they fire their engines on the far side of the moon. They, again, are out of touch with the Earth. We won't, won't know until they come around uh, about, uh, oh, it'll be 35 minutes later that they have performed that uh, function uh, properly. That's when they fire their descent propulsion system engine for the first time and go into that orbit, which will bring them down within 10 miles of the moon at 5.47 p.m. We'll be back for those maneuvers to report them to you from the CBS News Space Center. This is Walter Cronkite at the CBS News Space Center. Good afternoon. This has been a CBS News special report, the flight of Apollo 10. Special report, the flight of Apollo 10. Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters in New York, correspondent Walter Cronkite. The two Apollo 10 spacecraft have now disappeared again behind the far side of the moon. Signal was lost to Earth just a few moments ago, and this is an important pass behind the moon. Because this time, back there, where they have no communication with the Earth, Tom Stafford and Eugene Cernan in the lunar module called Snoopy will be firing their engines to bring them back on this next time around to the near side of the moon to within 10 miles of the moon's surface. The exact distance, 9.3 miles, if all goes as they plan, just about 50,000 feet over the moon's surface. They should reach that point at 5.32 p.m. It's just a few miles, about 18 miles before the lunar landing site uh, number two, which is the preferred site for the landing now expected in July of Apollo 11. They uh, 
just a few moments after that, we'll be passing over the landing site at 5.36, about four minutes later. Uh, they'll be over the landing site, and uh, then begin their, they will have begun their climb back out to an altitude uh, of 212 miles as they get behind the moon on that uh, revolution of the moon, their 14th. Uh, they, when they come around the next time, uh, around 7.30 p.m., that will be, uh, they will then uh, come down to within 11 miles in that same point over the moon's surface, roughly. They fire their engines and go back to rendezvous and uh, to redock with the command module at uh, 10 o'clock tonight. The actual docking coming at 11.19 p.m. So far today, they've had some very uh, high moments of this flight, uh, no pun intended, uh, as they're out there circling the moon. There have been some dramatic moments. Some of them have lasted for a couple of hours, some uh, for just a few moments. There have been some moments of concern about the flight of Apollo 10 today. The first uh, uh, little hitch came right after Eugene Cernan, and then Tom Stafford climbed into the lunar module this morning after they uh, awakened uh, uh, after a good night's sleep. They got down there and found that their communications back with John Young, left alone in the command module, weren't too good, nor with the ground. They finally got those straightened away, and communications have been uh, nearly perfect ever since. And then at 1 o'clock this afternoon, as they were pressurizing the uh, various parts of the spacecraft, they found that the three-foot tunnel that joins the two spacecraft, they could not uh, vent the uh, pressure from it, and that gave them a major cause for concern. They finally decided that uh, they could go ahead with the mission without venting the pressure completely there, getting it down to, oh, just about uh, uh, two-thirds of what it should be, which would be zero. Instead of five pounds per square inch, they got it down to three and a half pounds per square inch. Uh, but then a new problem developed. And because they could not uh, depressurize uh, that area, uh, additional friction was set up in their docking uh, configuration, in their rings, and there was some fear that they might, might cause damage to those uh, rings, which have to work when they come back and redock if they are to successfully redock and get back between the two uh, modules. Well, uh, they were behind the moon by the time the final test had to come. The uh, strain did not become as great as the uh, ground feared in Houston control. They'd given them some constraints that if it got to, to a certain point, uh, they could not go on with the mission. It did not get to that point. They separated as planned and uh, now they are separated. They made the pass around the moon in their separated configuration uh, with the lunar module Snoopy just about 35, 40 feet out from the command module, Charlie Brown. Uh, they then separated even further and now have disappeared to the far side of the moon for this next important maneuver, uh, which uh, is scheduled to come uh, at precisely, let me give you the moment, 4.35 p.m. That's when Stafford and Cernan in the... Uh, in uh, the uh, lunar module, fire their descent propulsion system engine. That's an engine that is throttleable. It can be throttled from 1,000 to 9,000 uh, uh, pounds of thrust. They fire that for the first time, giving it its first major test. Uh, they break, in effect, as the far side of the moon so that they slow down and drop toward the moon down to that 10-mile uh, altitude. The next maneuver at 435, and then uh, down, swooping down to the moon's surface uh, at uh, 5.32 p.m. Nelson Benton and Scott McLeod at Grumman Aircraft in Bethpage, Long Island, can tell us what's going on in that uh, lunar module right now. Well, are we sort of looking forward to one of the things that will be going on after that descent orbit insertion? When the limb goes down and gets down to that 50,000 feet, 50,000 foot point. One of the tests that has to be made is the LEMS altimeter. Anytime you are going to make a control landing on a surface, it's a good idea to know how high you are. Since normal altimeters are actuated by barometric pressure, and since there is no atmosphere on the moon, LEM4 is carrying a small pod about the size of a double loaf bread box right under the descent stage of the vehicle. It is a radar pod that looks around at the lunar surface. This does the looking, and it feeds what it sees into the cockpit. And Scott McLeod, what, how do you read what the radar is showing? Well, Nelson, up here in the cockpit, what we have is an altitude, an altitude rate on these two indicators, and also we have our forward and lateral velocity on this cross pointer. Primarily, we will get 
our best indications of those readings on the next flight, that's Apollo 11. This flight, Apollo 10, we will evaluate the radar, but really the proof of the pudding is the following flight. Walter, uh, the radar works uh, much better. It actually uh, sees very well down at about 18,000 feet, but it's, it's a bit, it will work this time a bit like uh, flying an aircraft over Pittsburgh and the Washington Control Center can't see you very well, but it may just get some indication that, that you are there, and that's uh, the kind of test we're having this time. 